if China takes military action against Taiwan and they do not succeed, what will happen to Chinese Communist Party and what will happen to China? From the Daniel K. Inouye Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies in Honolulu, Hawaii, this is the Security Nexus webinar. I'm your host, James Minnick, Colonel United States Army Retired and Professor at DKIA PCSS. Today is Monday, December 4th, and for the next hour, we'll embark on a crucial exploration of shifting tides in the Indo-Pacific. Today's discussion is not just a glimpse into China's evolving security outlook. It's an insight into one of the defining narratives shaping contemporary global affairs, the complexity, the complex interplay between China and the United States in the Indo-Pacific. In recent years, this vast region has become a fulcrum of power struggle, a battleground where two superpowers, China and the United States, jostle for dominance, influence, and security supremacy. The dynamic interplay between these giants isn't just confined to their respective national interests. It holds immense significance for the geopolitical landscape, global trade, and regional stability. At the heart of this competition lies differing ideologies, security doctrines, and strategic objectives. China propelled by aspirations of regional hegemony and growing assertiveness, confronts the established presence of the United States, whose alliances and military footprint span the Indo-Pacific, guarding its influences and interests. Today, our focus is to unravel the intricate web of China's security paradigm, dissecting its uh, perceptions, strategies, and responses to what is considered its primary threat, the United States. This isn't just about geopolitical maneuvering. It's about understanding the key drivers propelling China's security policy, the flashpoints that may ignite tensions, and the implications this rivalry bears on the regional and global stability. The audience submitted questions at registration, and we thank you for those questions. We'll address them later in the program. Today on the Security Nexus webinar, we're joined at our campus by Ms. Yoon Soon, fellow and co senior fellow and co-director of the East Asia program and director of the China program at the Stimson Center. Aloha, Yoon. What a privilege it is to have you here with us today. Thank you, doctor. Thank you for having me here today. Oh, my goodness. This is going to be such a fun event. But to kickstart it, we'd love for you to take uh, a few minutes. Tell us about your journey that brought you to being this security academic recognized authority on China uh, and foreign policy and Asia security, please. Thank you. Thank you for that question. It's uh, definitely an interesting journey so far. Uh, I'm originally from China. United States is my adopted country. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, I was trained and educated at the Foreign Affairs College in Beijing, which is an institution affiliated with the Chinese Foreign Ministry in China is nicknamed the cradle of Chinese diplomats. Uh, I was there for seven years, both for undergraduate and graduate studies. Then I decided to come to the United States basically to see a different story because I've known the Chinese version and now I would like to hear that what is the alternative version to what the world actually looks like. And how does it look? Uh, it looks very different from the Chinese narrative for sure. Um, since then, I've been working in the U.S. think tank community for about 20 years now, and it really gives me great perspectives or great access to different perspectives here in the U.S. and also there in, in China and able to compare the different perspectives and to present a different angle to what people usually understand as uh, Chinese foreign policy. I rely primarily on... Um, first-hand sources, as well as uh, primary language sources to uh, do my research and reach my conclusion. So it's not based on second-hand information or uh, English language media. So my hope is that my work will present the authentic flavor of uh, China's foreign policy, its goals, and its approaches. I have enjoyed reading your work. And I think that... Uh the 
our audience will enjoy as we discuss about uh, some of the work that uh, you've been writing about. You're pretty prol prolific. You have uh, uh, been asked to testify. You are actually quite a hot commodity, it appears. You are too kind. <laughs> to set the stage, let's delve into uh, China's security policy in the Indo-Pacific. How does China aim to protect its interests here in this vital region? Oh, that's a very good and a very broad question. I think to begin with, for the Chinese definition of its national security agenda, coming to this region, the most important agenda is on the issue of Taiwan. Okay. It's about the reunification with Taiwan, which China and the Chinese Communist Party sees as their destiny. That reunification is not a question, it's a must. The only question is when and how it will happen. So for China, when they look at the issue of reunification, the most important obstacle is the United States because uh, they see that US potential intervention is the single biggest factor of uncertainty coming to the Chinese use of force against Taiwan. In fact, when they think about the US potential intervention without that potential, they see that Taiwan doesn't stand a chance. So the opportunity in their view for Taiwan to accept a negotiated settlement on the issue of reunification will not happen yeah. until Taiwan realizes that US is not going to be their fallback plan. Then and only then would Taiwan be willing to negotiate. So when the Chinese think about the uh, security issue when in the West Pacific, of course, from north to south, there are issues, Korean Peninsula, East China Sea, and also South China Sea, but there's no other issue as sacred and as important as the issue of Taiwan for the Chinese. And here, United States play a, a critical role in that, um, in that future. So you describe uh, security issues from north to south, but I would, is it safe to say that uh, sometimes the priorities have uh, shifted or are they, is it constantly just Taiwan 24 seven for since 1949? Uh, among the four issues, um, the different at different times, different issue would be the top priority. For example, during the first year of the Trump administration in 2017, the Chinese priority was very much focused on the Korean Peninsula because of the uh, the heated exchange of, uh, of, of rhetoric between President Trump and North Korea at the time, mm. it made the Chinese believe that a Korea contingency might be imminent. So during that year, I would say that the Korean contingency was a top priority. And if we go back further into the Obama administration, especially during the second term of the Obama administration, Taiwan was not the issue mm. because KMT was in charge. Uh, and the relationship between China and Taiwan was going relatively well. So at that time, South China Sea was a priority, especially given China's militarization and land reclamation in the South China Sea. So at different times, we are seeing different issues being treated as a top priority. So with Taiwan as the top priority now, what causes that to slip in priority? What, what are the things that you would think that Beijing would be able to relax its, its, its uh, uh, emphasis there and consider other priority areas? Um, the past dependence one is on uh, who is in charge in Taiwan, yeah. right? So when the current opposition party, KMT, was in charge under the uh, President Ma ying before 2016, the relationship was relatively stable and China was using economic integration yes. as its primary strategy to deal with the issue of uh, reunification. But then under the current DPP administration, you are seeing that the Chinese approach was very much on the coercive and deterrent side because they believe that DPP government's eventual aspiration is to pursue Taiwan independence. So it depends on uh, the domestic politics in Taiwan it also depends on the relationship between United States and China. When the relationship is relatively okay and relatively um, 
stable. I think the Chinese will perceive that the U.S. is not trying to provide assistance, especially military assistance, to support the so-called Taiwan independence as much. Safe to say with uh, Taiwan elections uh, just next month, that yeah. uh, priority won't shift anytime soon and could be dependent on outcomes of the election? Very much so. I think the different outcomes of the election will produce very different outlook of cross relations, as well as the U.S.-China interaction on the issue of Taiwan. You spoke a little bit about uh, uh, current uh, President Xi Jinping in your, uh, in, uh, in your earlier remark. I wonder if you might uh, talk about uh, how the political objectives and territorial concerns have shifted, how they've changed uh, in the last uh, few several years of, uh, of his uh, rule. Um, I would say that overall, when Xi Jinping took over, mm. um, we are seeing a change of uh, prioritization on China's agenda. So in the past, you might remember during the first, I would say, the 30 years of uh, the China's reform and opening up, the Chinese foreign policy mantra, as dictated by uh, the previous leader, Deng Xiaoping, was to keep a low profile yes. and bide our time. And the logic is that we're going to keep a low profile to build our strengths, to engage the world, to build our economy. And it doesn't mean that China will not become strong. It will mean that China's primary goal was to seek economic development. But under Xi Jinping, we're seeing the prioritization changing because um, one could argue that this keeping a low profile and biding our time was useful to build China's economic development. But at the same time, some in China would argue that China made significant sacrifice mm. in the realm of uh, national security, in the realm of uh, territorial integrity, for example, in shelving the disputes, maritime disputes in the East and South China Seas. So when Xi Jinping came to power, I think his conviction has been Mao Zedong made China independent, Deng Xiaoping made China rich, and me as a paramount leader of China, I am going to make China strong. So we're seeing that under President Xi, national security has been elevated to such a high priority position that economic development is no longer seen as a paramount goal of the government and of the state. So instead, we're seeing more and more policies by China that one would argue would sacrifice or victimize yes. China's economic development in pursuit of national security. And that's exactly uh, what, where we are today. Some would argue that China has already shifted from a developmental state to a security state. I think that conclusion is a little too soon, um, but given what has happened in the past several years, we're definitely seeing China moving more and more towards a security direction. So I wanna pull a little bit on your comment regarding um, national security. And so regarding those institutional changes in China's foreign policy, specifically the Central National Security Commission's role, I wonder if you could discuss how this commission uh, is shaping China's decision-making in foreign policy matters. Absolutely. Just related to the last question, since national security has been elevated to such a sacred position in China's decision-making, in fact, Xi Jinping came up with a national security outlook very early on in his uh, in his in his terms, um, and since then China has developed twenty two categories of national security. So each area of China's economy, politics, social life, you could find it being related or framed in a national security perspective. So as the institutional reform. National Security Commission was created rather early on. It was in fact created in late 2013. So quite soon after Xi Jinping took power. And the, given the seniority of the commission, I would say the National Security Commission has replaced Foreign Affairs Commission or Foreign Affairs Office as the supreme decision-making organ of, uh, of China's national security apparatus. And two changes happened under that. Mm. The first one is uh, Xi Jinping, of course, is the head of the National Security Commission. Sure. 
In the past, before Xi Jinping, Chinese Communist Party had pursued a leadership style called collective leadership, okay. which means that the nine members of the Politburo Standing Committee, they were seen more or less as equals. And each one of them had a say in foreign policy issues. But that has changed under President Xi, that among the seven members, first uh, the Politburo Standing Committee has been, uh, has been cut, the membership has been cut by two. So now instead of nine, we have seven members of the Politburo Standing Committee. And secondly, in terms of the distribution of labor, we're seeing Xi Jinping being the leader on almost every single issue, especially on foreign policy and national security issues. Xi Jinping is the decision maker. We don't see other members of the Politburo Standing Committee carrying a role in those, uh, in those policy making anymore. So it really concentrated the decision making authority to Xi himself. So she is supported by the National Security Commission, which in terms of the membership is a much higher level in terms of the bureaucratic ranking. In the past, the Foreign Affairs Office, uh, is re Foreign Affairs Commission is mm -hmm. regarded as um, the policy coordination um, and its membership has been primarily cabinet members. So we're seeing, for example, the Ministry of State Security, uh, Piawe having a seat at the table, we're seeing, uh, for example, the Department of Propaganda also having a seat at the table. But if you look at the composition of the membership of the National Security Commission, its membership is one level more senior to the, uh, to the, to the Foreign Affairs Commission, which means that, well, by default, a lot of the foreign policy issues are seen as national security issues to begin with, right? Yeah. And when the authority or the membership of the National Security Commission is also senior to the Foreign Affairs Commission, it means that the National Security Commission would naturally take the lead and having the bigger authority, higher authority to make decisions on issues related to, to foreign policy. If they were going to self-grade themselves, or she, President Xi was going to self-grade himself and says, okay, I've set this up. I think I've grade myself about a A, B, C, D. Where would he, where, how, does, how is he doing? Does he think he's doing now with this uh, new formation? Uh, I think he would say this is a pretty good setup because uh, it really steered the priority of the bureaucracy in the direction that he feels is the most important, which is national security. And among the 22 categories yeah. of national security, regime security is seen as a supreme, the paramount consideration among all of them. So I would say that from Xi's perspective, this setup is extremely necessary to achieve the direction and to achieve the goals as he sees as a, as, a, as a priority for the system. Well, I don't guess I'm surprised that uh, regime uh, stability, survival ability would be uh, number one. I guess the question I might ask is, is it because, uh, of course it ought to be, or is it because we've got real concerns domestically or externally that uh, is threatening us and therefore we have to put a lot of prior, um, you know, resources or effort to ensure that this is not uh, uh, threatened anymore? Uh, I think it is both. Mm. I think when Xi Jinping stepped into, um, into the paramount leader position, uh, I think he found China to be at a place that is unprecedented. So when he took power, China has been in this reform and the opening up for about three decades. And China's economy has grown tremendously. China became the world factory. China also became the economic powerhouse of the, of the world. Mm -hmm. So China has grown wealthy. Mm -hmm. But I think for him, it raises two questions. The first one is externally, is a wealthy China regarded as a strong China? Yes. Has the national wealth accumulated during those three decades transpired into a higher status of China in the international system? And I think a lot of people would say that, well, after the Hu Jintao administration, where people saw China as being wealthy but weak, the argument was that, well, China was richer, but not necessarily better respected. So for Xi Jinping, he made it very clear that his vision, the rejuvenation of the Chinese nation, is not just about material wealth. 
Yes. It's also about China being a strong power. So I think that's the first consideration. Mm. The second factor is that change the Xi Jinping's vision for China. I think that has also has something to do with uh, the prevalent corruption problem okay. that had existed uh, when Xi Jinping took over. It, it's about what political direction that the Chinese Communist Party wants to take China. Were they going to go for a corrupted system? Were they going to go for political liberalization as a lot of people outside China had anticipated or expected? Where is Chinese Communist Party going to be in this country in terms of the political system? So I think Xi Jinping looked at all those questions. He decided that Chinese Communist Party is the best thing that has happened to China. It cannot and will not relinquish its authority or relinquish its, its leadership. And instead, Chinese Communist Party will be the ruling party of China for the foreseeable future. And it will use self, uh, for example, self-purification mechanism to improve its governance and improve its record. So I think those two factors contributed to Xi Jinping's decision that China is going to pursue this path. It is a path that he envisions for China moving forward. So President Xi would see that the CCP is the best thing that's uh, happened to China. I assume this is because we're talking about um, the rise in, in uh, the, the, cap the livelihood of its people have risen. They have uh, greater respect or influence globally. Um, maybe other reasons. Uh, I guess I would ask you, how about the people? What would they think when they compare where they have been or where they are? Do they too see that this is good for them? That's a very good question mm. because uh, I don't think anyone has been able to do a survey to look at how Chinese public opinion really sees where China is and where the Chinese people's livelihood, um, how, how would they rank it or how would they score it? But what we do know is that even that China has been, well, just remember 40 years ago, China was still a very poor country. So through this, uh, this campaign to build the Chinese economy, I would say the Chinese Communist Party has, has accumulated a tremendous amount of performance legitimacy domestically. For people who still have the memory of starvation, of hunger, of poverty, for example, during the Cultural Revolution, and the historical memory of the instability and the chaos of mm -hmm. China under those, uh, those circumstances, yeah. I think they will see that China today has progressed and has developed tremendously under the Chinese Communist Party's um, policy. So... Then coming to the issue of, there's also another issue of nationalism, yes. which has been a very useful instrument for uh, domestic policy and foreign policy of the, of the Chinese government. I think the Chinese public opinion always needs to be looked at in a qualified manner. And what I mean is, well, in China, there's no freedom of information, right? right. So the information the general public receives to reach their conclusion and reach their assessment about the government's performance, especially in the foreign policy arena, comes from the government. Yes. So the public opinion is not independent, which makes the assessment of their authenticity really difficult. But what we do know is that the government has developed a very effective system to indoctrinate the Chinese general public about certain perspectives. Like for example, uh, if you look at COVID, if you ask Chinese people that, well, where do you think Chinese, uh, where do you think that the COVID virus came from? Mm -hmm. I bet a lot of people would tell you that they are convinced it came from a U.S. military lab. Mm -hmm. And that's the result of the Chinese government indoctrination because uh, it's repeatedly told to the people that, well, U.S. military lab created this virus and they send well, they basically use U.S. military personnel to bring it to China in the October of uh, 2018 in the military game. Mm. So I think that's a good example to show that, well, if the Chinese population are indeed convinced that the U.S. is a culprit for COVID, then their assessment of the Chinese government performance is going to be much better than otherwise. Mm. 
Thank you for that. You would, when you kind of uh, bookmarked um, the uh, predominant leaders and you'd indicated that uh, Mao brought uh, um, independence, uh, uh, Deng Xiaoping uh, wealth, and now Xi Jinping looking at uh, power. And so when you think of power, you could say, for what purpose? And, uh, you know, it could be that uh, we need power because we need prestige. We need power because we have uh, enemies. We need power because we need to uh, uh, dominate in areas we're presently not dominating. So when he thinks he needs power, what is he seeking? What is he seeking it for, would you say? I think there are two perspectives that we can look at this. One is external, the other one is internal. And the external perspective basically says that, what does China aspire to be? If you look at the 5,000 years or 3,000 years of, uh, of, of, of history mm. on record of China, China indeed had been the Middle Kingdom, right? It, it was the strongest power in Asia. Uh, it sees itself as the center of the, of the universe. That's why it's called Middle Kingdom. So I think externally, when China looks at power, and Xi Jinping talks about the rejuvenation of the Chinese nation, the connotation is that China is returning to its rightful place in the international system. And the Chinese will say that for the majority of the past 2000 years, if you look at China, China was the largest economy in the whole world. And China was potentially the most consequential power in the world. Yeah. So I think externally, there is a sense of historical destiny. This is what China is. Mm. And that power is what China commanded. And it should be what China is will command and is commanding now. That's the external angle. The internal angle, of course, goes back to the performance legitimacy. I think to be able to elevate China to its rightful place in mm. history, and there's a leadership of CCP, and under the leadership of President Xi Jinping, I think there's no better manifestation of their capability, of their competence, and of their legitimacy to govern the country and lead the country in the direction that it should be. So there are these two angles that we could look at. Thank you. No, that makes sense. Considering these developments, uh, what are the perceived risks and the concerns regarding a potential regional arms race, especially influenced by China's stance as they pursue power? Uh, a lot of countries don't see eye to eye with mm. China in terms of China's desired regional order, because uh, if you have smaller countries, uh, China might see itself as a benevolent hegemon, China might see itself as a benevolent leader of the region. Right. But um, I always tell the Chinese uh, interlocutors or Chinese officials that whether China is seen as a benevolent power does not depend on China's narrative. It depends on how other countries in the region sees China. It's not about your, about your self-assessment. It's about how others see you, right? So I think in that sense, what the Chinese have been trying to do is try to reassure countries in the region that China's rise is peaceful and China's rise is benevolent. But unfortunately, because of a number of issues, um, to begin with, China does have territorial disputes with India and it has maritime disputes with Japan, South Korea, with Philippines and with Vietnam and with even Indonesia and Malaysia in terms of the maritime rights. So can, these territorial issues are not win-win solution. There's not going to be win-win solution. So it's either or, it's very, yeah. it's a very much a dichotomy. So that's one factor. Another factor that has undermined China's uh, ability to achieve its uh, historical, well, its rightful place in history is uh, in fact the historical memory that for countries like South Korea, or countries mm. like Vietnam, what they remember about China is not necessarily a benevolent hegemon. They remember being invaded repeatedly by this large neighbor in their neighborhood. And some would say the 2000 invasions from China into, uh, in, into Vietnam historically. So this historical memory does form the foundation of suspicion, anxiety, insecurity, and even hostility in some cases. Last but not least, China's political system. In Chinese Communist Party's mind that this is the best system for China, but for other countries in the, in the region, they see the system as not so transparent, does not offer room for public discussion, 
about, for example, issues of peace or war. So when they look at the decision making process of the Chinese government and Chinese Communist Party, they find, they find it to be highly unpredictable. So when they deal with uh, the Chinese government, I think there is a high level of uncertainty because this system basically is ruled by one party and the one party is ruled by one person. So what if this one person decides that, well, maybe it is a good idea for us to use force, for example, in the uh, dispute of South China Sea or East China Sea so that we can take care of the problem. There's no guarantee. So for all these region, reasons, some countries in the region do have anxiety about China's rise and where China will be, as well as the extent of China's ambition, which is why they try to seek assistance or seek partnerships with the United States to introduce this offshore balancing or offshore balancer to counterbalance China's rise and counterbalance China's agenda, which is also why that China sees US as a main obstacle to the peace and stability of the region. Because from the Chinese perspective, if there's no United States, then countries in the region won't have that backup plan. Then China's preference would have prevailed. Whether the countries in the region like it, that's a different matter. Mm. But if they don't have other choices, this is the only way to go. It, it seems from my view, or my vantage point anyway, that many of the countries aren't looking for either or. A, yeah. a situation, a world where there's only a China in their region yeah. or, a, or a region that only has the United States because they actually perhaps perceive benefit from both. Um, that's a question that we hear countries talk a lot about. Don't force us to don't don't force us to choose, mm. right? And my reaction is twofold. The first one is, well, it's great that you have the choice, because uh, if there's no choice, if it's just China prevailing, then it's not necessarily going to be the desired uh, position for a lot of countries in the region to be. Mm. So it's great that U.S. is actually here offering a different choice. And that goes to a second point, it's all about agency. Yes. Because uh, within the great power competition, when there are two great powers trying to compete for influence and for the alignment the choices of countries in the region, it does give smaller countries in the region the agency to well, manipulate or to balance them against each other. And I would say here, uh, the former, former, former foreign secretary of the Singaporean foreign ministry, mm. Bill Harry has a great theory that it's all about the agency. It means that smaller countries cannot be lazy. You have to constantly calculate, look at every single issue from different perspective, calculate your best strategy to maximize your national interest. So I think that would be a, um, a preferred strategy for countries who feel that they are stuck in the middle. And the competition that is going on perhaps even gives those countries uh, the opportunity to be seen, where absent that, um, they're, they're tension over here, attention over here. It does. And it does give the countries in the region a lot of um, room to, mm -hmm. uh, to manipulate and to maneuver, right? Well, for example, um, well, President Biden was in, uh, in Vietnam earlier in the fall, and now we're looking at the Chinese president visiting Vietnam. I mean, what is the chance of both Chinese and American presidents visiting Vietnam within a couple of months? So that really put Vietnam on the map. It shows that both great powers are trying to compete for Vietnam's hand or Vietnam's favor. And I will say that it does give them agency and it gives them a lot of bargaining power with both great powers. Mm. I'm going to uh, switch a little bit over to uh, flashpoints again. And sure. we'll maybe go a little deeper. And you kind of set us up with those. But... Um, as we consider the potential flash points from uh, the Korean Peninsula down to uh, the South China Sea, um, what's the real prospect that conflict could arise in one of these areas? Um, that's a great question. I think we need to first draw the distinction between accidents mm. and the conflicts because these are two very different things. What I would say is happening in the West Pacific is that China, especially Chinese military, is trying to use its own tempo, its intensified tempo, to try to force or impose structural changes to the U.S. military activities in the region. 
So when people talk about, for example, the unsafe and unprofessional intercepts that the Chinese warplanes and Chinese naval warships are trying to uh, impose on the on the U.S. military uh, military counterparts, that's very much the goal to to force U.S. further away from the Chinese coastal lines, to try to force U.S. to reduce or mitigate the frequency of their, for example, reconnaissance and surveillance uh, activities in the in the Chinese periphery, I would say that is the primary uh, goal or the strategy that China is trying to is trying to engage in. So when the Chinese talk about uh, when we want to engage China uh, on crisis management, the Chinese kids talk about crisis prevention. Don't come to my neighborhood, and we won't have a crisis, right? Right. But the reality is that both U.S. military and the Chinese military are in existence in this region. They are. So it does increase the possibility or the likelihood of potential accidents. And here, I think the example that people think about most is the EP3 incident back in 2001. Yes. And you even hear um, senior officials like Kurt Campbell saying that, well, the chance of another EP3 in the next few years right. would be higher than 50%. Right. But having an accident does not necessarily translate into a full-scale conflict. That's true. On that, I would say that the PLA is under pretty tight leash in terms of the escalation ladder. But that also makes the mill-to-mill dialogue or the hotline mechanism between the two defense departments uh, even more important mm. that when such an accident does happen, um, there will be a channel of communication. And if you recall, I think for people uh, who observed the balloon incident uh, earlier this year, right. when the incident happened, the hotline was not answered. And the Chinese refused to have a conversation with the uh, Secretary of Defense Austin about the, uh, the balloon incident. So now I think the focus is on how to reestablish those channels of communication. So when an accident does happen, it will be effectively managed. I'm going to take you up to uh, the Korean Peninsula, a place I've spent uh, over four decades uh, um, engaged in the security of. Um, it is, when I arrived, uh, I guess 1982 was my first uh, military assignment there. It was, everybody knew it was a threat. There was no doubt, but it was a localized threat. It was only going to erupt there on the peninsula. That is not the case anymore. And increasingly, that will not be the case going forward. We know that uh, very recently, uh, the uh, Russians and the uh, North Koreans have uh, improved their relationship to a, a level which we haven't seen probably uh, since uh, the fall of the uh, Soviet Union. Mm. Um, what does China think about this burgeoning relationship? Well, to begin with, I would say the Chinese do have agency with both uh, Korea, uh, North Korea and Russia, right? China has remained the single largest economic patron of North Korea. I believe more than 95% of North Korea's foreign trade is conducted with, uh, with China. China also provides aid yes. uh, as well as oil to, uh, to North Korea. So China does have significant agency over North Korea. We can debate as for what that agency and influence can be used to, to do mm -hmm. because so far China has not been able to convince North Korea to abandon its nuclear weapons. So there is a very popular theory, which I do uh, support, that is uh, influence is only usable or effective when, the, when your objective aligns with the countries that you're influencing. So, but it does mean that China has significant influence over North Korea. Uh, on the other hand, we also know that as a result of the war in Ukraine, China's influence over Russia has mm. also grown significantly. China is pretty much the main, uh, the only main trading partner has uh, has remained for Russia, and the China is also providing dual use technology and dual use parts to Russia, and the revenue creation, of course, supports the Russian war campaign. But on the other hand, I think historically, mm. when North Korea tried to manipulate Russia and China against each other. Um, the Chinese have never found themselves to be in the advantage of the position. And here, the example one is uh, during the Korean, well, before the Korean War, how uh, Kim Jong-un used the manipulation 
to basically play Stalin and Mao Zedong against each other to get both sides in the end join into the, uh, uh, the, the conflict. And then after the Korean War, uh, I think North Korea also very effectively used this balancing strategy to create the anxiety in both Beijing and Moscow about the other side's influence and relationship with North Korea. So I would say that North Korea has been a master of manipulation in this sense. Indeed. So when North Korea and Russia have this rapprochement and start to uh, warm up and strengthen their relationship, I think the sense of concern in China is real. The first, the first concern is that um, not all their transactions or their agreements are transparent to China. Mm. So there's no sense of certainty right. as for what Russia has transferred to North Korea and what North Korea is giving back in return. Yeah. And that the if Russia does transfer, and South Koreans would argue that they already have, right. the technology uh, to military technology to North Korea, it only will strengthen this, the trend of arms race in the region. Mm. With North Korea's strength and capability, South Korea will want to catch up. Japan will want to catch up. And the United States will be joined even closer into the uh, security architecture of Northeast Asia than it is already. So for China, that is seen as a major security threat for China. Second factor is that when you look at China's desired order in Northeast Asia, it does not wish to see the polarization was returned to the Cold War right. Northern Triangle versus Southern Triangle, because that's not in China's interest. No. In China's desired regional order, they would prefer for both Japan and South Korea to be absorbed into the Chinese orbit, or at the minimum, remain neutral in China's great power competition with the United States. But if North Korea and Russia are strengthening their rapprochement, and China has to be put into it because China cannot afford not to, then it will strengthen this trend of polarization of Northeast Asia, which is not in China's interest. I remember um, during, I guess it was 2018, during a period of, of uh, greater engagement, uh, inter-Korean engagement and U.S. Uh, North Korean engagement, I wrote a piece that uh, uh, looked at how the U.S. ought to bring North Korea closer into, use your words, into their orbit, uh, turn a foe into a friend for fear that we could end up in a security situation that kind of resembles where we are today. Mm -hmm. um, how successful do you think that they feel they are being at uh, pulling South Korea and Japan closer into their orbit? They be in China. Here. Well, look at the uh, the Camp David um, yeah. in this past August, and yeah. look at the strengthened extended deterrence uh, among U.S., Japan, and U.S., Japan, South Korea. I would say that this effort has not been particularly successful. However, I think the Chinese will emphasize that well, one, it depends on who is in uh, who is in power in both Japan and South Korea. Um, had Candidate Lee of the progressive side of the camp of South Korea won the election uh, and President Yoon did not, uh, did not succeed. I think South Korea's external alignment strategy will look different. quite different from today. Yeah. So I think the Chinese will say that not all is lost. Right. There are still future potentials that South Korea could be turned around because the, the social foundation for what the Chinese would call anti-Americanism mm and the social foundation for a more neutral position between um, for South Korea, between US and China does exist. So what I think uh, among the things you said I heard is that uh, China is able to take a bit of a, a longer view and say, depending on uh, who rises, which administrations rise to power, whether it's in Korea, Japan, Australia, et cetera, alignments may alter and therefore, let's see what happens. Uh, yes, and also another factor is uh, China's economic power, right? Because uh, if you look at South Korea and Japan, their economic dependence on China is more significant. They're trying to reduce that dependence, but it's still significant for the foreseeable future. Mm. So like when China decided to impose restriction export control measures on critical mineral mineral elements like, uh, like gallium, and germanium, yes. it does affect how Japan and South Korea calculate their relationship and calculate their economic losses. So I think China still holds certain um, leverages against Japan and South Korea. It's just they have to be extremely careful 
about using punitive measures, trade sanctions for retaliation, because uh, from the example of sad deployment right. and the unofficial um, trade sanctions that China imposed on South Korea, those measures potentially only push South Korea further uh, away from China and closer with the uh, with United States. So it's not necessarily in China's interest. The agony or the dilemma for Beijing is that they really don't have an effective way mm. to influence the policy of Japan and South Korea. On one hand, they could pursue the punitive measures, which will be counterproductive. But if they don't produce uh, pursue those punitive measures, instead they try to play nice and with a softball right. approach, they cannot stop Japan and South Korea from pursuing a closer alignment and a cooperation with the United States anyway. Mm. So if the result is uh, is not really multiple, it doesn't show a lot of variation. I think that's really where the frustration comes from. There are certainly segments within this country that uh, would take uh, more of an isolationist approach, would pull back at least from uh, the region. Do you think that China uh, hopes that uh, that might that elements of uh, of, of that uh, leaning might rise and uh, and and then their problems will become different. Uh, yes, their problems will be very different. So, for example, when China looks at the Trump administration um, and the four years under Trump administration, their conclusion was: well, Trump had done tremendous damage to U.S. leadership credibility and alliances in the in the region. But at the same time, Trump has also, during the four years, especially the last year, created a tremendous turbulence mm. in the U.S.-China relations to the extent that the Chinese were almost convinced that Trump was going to start a war with China during uh, the last several months of his, uh, his administration in order to uh, make himself a wartime president. Um, so I think for, for the Chinese, not that they can determine or decide who the next U.S. Um, president will be. But for them, a, a Biden administration at least would be more stable hmm. and create more stability. Well, we will see where this goes. I want to, in our remaining time, I want to turn to uh, the, some of the questions that were submitted. We had <clears throat> um, approaching, I guess we had about 275 uh, registration uh, Registrants and a lot of questions. We categorize them, we synthesize them, and here are a few. Um, as we think about uh, in this category of security and geopolitics, how does China balance its strategic interest in the South China Sea? And what specific actions or incidents might lead to heightened tensions or conflict in the mm. region? I think for South China Sea, the center of the tension or the attention uh, from the Chinese side has been the U.S. bang up. Okay. From the freedom of navigation operations. And in the past, it's more, well, still um, the issue of the U.S. military surveillance and reconnaissance, ISR, in the region uh, has been a perceived as a security threat for China. So the Chinese strategy has been to gradually push U.S. military ISR further away from the Chinese homeland, right, yes. from the Chinese coast. And some would argue that the re land reclamation the creation of the artificial islands in the middle of the South China Sea is one way to either mitigate or reduce the frequency or the tempo of the U.S. Uh, military activities in the region. So at different times, a put, um, I think the concern about a potential escalation of tension between U.S. and China due to an accident yes. in, the, in the South China Sea has been, has been extremely high. However, I would say that this particular uh, angle needs to be taken with a caveat as well, because if you look at the potential conflict in the South China Sea, it's not going to, at least in the Chinese view, it's not going to become a full conflict, meaning it will be localized, it will be limited or focused in the South China Sea. Because uh, I think for, for the Chinese, South China Sea compared to Taiwan, mm. Um, the strategic importance of the Taiwan issue is much higher. So for the South China Sea, potential conflict or accident will be much more limited. But with Taiwan, the Chinese will have no options but to, but to go all in, which means that the EP3 incident, which we saw in 2001, could repeat itself in the, uh, in the South China Sea. But the hope is that with the potential to resume the mill-to-mill -mill dialogue, 
and the crisis management or crisis prevention mechanism and discussion between the two, even if there is such an accident, it would be effectively and timely managed. Well, let's move uh, then to Taiwan and regional stability there. You, could you elaborate on China's strategy regarding Taiwan, considering its efforts to prevent growing U.S.-Taiwan relations, maintaining a show of force, and then maybe discuss potential implications for regional stability mm -hmm. Taiwan? I think for Taiwan, when China says that they prefer peaceful unification, mm -hmm. uh, they are being honest. Okay. Because uh, if anything that people learn from the war in, uh, in Ukraine, it is a prohibitive cost yes. of the war, not just the human cost, but also the financial cost, the diplomatic cost, the political cost. So I think the, when the Chinese say that they do want peaceful reunification, uh, it, is a genuine, it is a genuine statement. But how could the peaceful unification be created? Mm. I think for a very long time, the Chinese have relied on economic integration with a belief that, well, if the economies of the two sides of the Taiwan Strait are so closely interwoven, they are so closely interdependent on each other, then hopefully integration on the social level and on the political level will follow. Well, that has not happened yeah. in the recent history, which uh, leads to the question as for what will be the effective strategy for China? I think that here um, people need to understand prevention of independence and pursuit of unification are in fact two different goals. Some would say that some Chinese would say that these are the two sides of the same coin. Mm. But when the DPP is in power in Taiwan, the Chinese priority is always on the side of prevention of Taiwan independence. It's seen as a higher priority. So I would say that the Chinese leader, we know that, well, there are a lot of questions about how eager Xi Jinping wants uh, reunification with Taiwan. And my response has always been, it doesn't matter how eager he is, because he needs to, effect, he needs to very soberly and real, realistically assess his capability. That if China does start a, a military campaign against Taiwan, what the end game would look like, especially given the U.S. potential U.S. intervention. In the event of the U.S. intervention, I don't think the Chinese are confident that they're, they're going to prevail, which means that they will have to carry an extremely high political risk that if China takes military action against Taiwan and they do not succeed, what will happen to the Chinese Communist Party and what will happen to China? So that's a possibility that I bet that Xi Jinping and the Chinese government will not want to entertain. So the precarious status quo has been unstable, has been delicate for decades, but it looks like there's no better option for China. So they're prioritizing the prevention of what they call Taiwan independence and the push for peaceful reunification with a very sober understanding that currently China does not have the capability to impose reunification on Taiwan. Do you think that uh, that has been shaped or influenced any by uh, ongoing recent conflicts? Uh, in Ukraine? You know, Ukraine, uh, mm -hmm. uh, in uh, the Middle East, et cetera? Uh, more on Ukraine, because okay. uh, in the Middle East, Hamas is not seen as a state actor. So the war in Ukraine is more um, a traditional war that most likely will be replicated if China does decides to take military actions against Taiwan. I think it, primarily the, the, the strategic lessons are two-folded. The first one is that if you fight a war, you better be certain about what the result will be. Mm. The Chinese has been vastly disappointed by the Russia's inability to achieve a decisive and quick military uh, victory yes. on the battlefield. And in fact, when they look at the, the, the Russian military operation, there are a lot of comments about how ineffective the Russian military has been. So that's the first takeaway. If you fight a war, you better be sure that you can win. The second lesson is that the cost of the war is not just on the battlefield. Right. It will be on the financial, diplomatic, economic, trade, political, all these different spectrums. So the Chinese understand very well that reunification is an integral component of the rejuvenation of the Chinese nation. But the reunification should not be the cost. Well, um, let me rephrase. 
reunification should not cause China the rejuvenation of the Chinese nation. If the cost of the reunification is China completely loses its hope or its prospect for national rejuvenation, then they will have to rethink about whether this is really the highest priority for China to take military actions to achieve the reunification. Hmm. Okay, let's turn to Belt and Road. A Belt and Road Initiative and uh, diplomatic engagements. From the China's perspective, how does the Belt and Road Initiative, BRI, contribute to regional development and stability while addressing concerns about corruption, sovereignty, and international cooperation? Boy, there's a lot of things about the Oh my Road goodness, there's a lot of interest in BRI in those questions. Well, BRI as a geoeconomic strategy, um, it, it does serve to expand the China's superior of influence, right? Mm. And I think from the Chinese perspective, with that much of funding and financial resources being put into this effort, it has created a lot of infrastructure projects. It has created local job opportunities. It also has had the trade facilitation effect that cannot be measured by um, just monetary value, right? When you look at the railway between China and Europe, yes, the operation of the railway may not be per- profitable, but the trade facility or the trade creation impact Mm. of that project is significant. So I think from the Chinese perspective, BRI has been quite successful in terms of one, creating uh, more infrastructure capability along the uh, the countries of the participating in BRI, two, sweeten or strengthen the relationship between China and the BRI countries, because when China provides that much funding and provides that much projects in uh, that many projects to a certain country, it is bound to have an impact over the diplomatic relations. And the third one is, of course, the, the negative consequences that people you often talk about, the debt trap diplomacy, the, uh, the issue of corruption, which is not necessarily a priority of the BRI projects, at least not so far, uh, and also the social and environmental impact of the BRI projects. BRI has been there for 10 years, and yes. we are seeing that uh, China has become much more careful and calculating coming to what type of projects they will be supporting, being small and pretty. It used to be uh, a big and impressionist. Now it is being uh, meticulous, being small and pretty. So moving forward, I would say that um, you have, we have seen that China bring up the idea of a global development initiative which basically introduces more partners into the development campaign. China has proposed global security initiative last year. And this year, China has proposed another concept called global civilization uh, initiative. So we do see that the Chinese foreign strategy is also morphing away from BRI, which is a China's gift to the world, Mm -hmm. to global development initiative where China is a part of the world. Mm. So I do see that China's strategy on this particular development issue is also evolving. Oh, that's fascinating. I would note that countries actually don't undertake uh, uh, national railroad initiatives for profit because I don't think there are models out there for, for profit making out of those. They, they cost, but to your larger point, uh, it's what do they generate from their cost? And uh, that was fascinating. Let us do. Uh, let us do this. Um, in the closing time uh, that we have, I think I'd ask you if you would uh, share a book recommendation uh, with our audience. Uh, the book that I would challenge, uh, I would recommend, is um, a book that was published this past April. Uh, it was uh, written by three authors. Richard Bush, Bonnie Glazer, and Ryan Hess, three uh, most savvy observers and analysts on the issue of Taiwan. The book is called U.S.-Taiwan Relations. Will China's challenge become a crisis? Mm. So it really unpacks the history of the issue of Taiwan, PRC's position, U.S. position, and um, the book calls for a much more nuanced approach that combines both deterrence and reassurance towards both China and Taiwan toward a, a, a peaceful um, prospect moving forward. I feel that book really uh, offers the facts 
that uh, people got to be aware of when they discuss the Taiwan issue because it is a highly emotional issue. Yes. Um, but it's also based on a lot of historical deliberation of what each term means mm. and what each policy means. So I think for today's discussion on Taiwan, where a lot of people very broadly uh, cite certain terms or use a certain prospect as a foundation of their argument, to look at the facts are very important. Oh, well, thank you for that. This has been absolutely fascinating for, uh, for me, for the uh, audience. I hope that uh, you enjoyed it. Um, let us, as we close, let us work together uh, toward a secure and resilient future in the Indo-Pacific. I'd ask you to join me again in two weeks for an interview with uh, my colleague, Professor Lamy Kim. In that focused discussion, Dr. Lamy Kim will unravel the crucial theme on nuclear Indo-Pacific, a region marked by six nuclear armed states and numerous threshold powers. With that, this has been Security Nexus webinar. I'm James Minnick, and I urge you to stay vigilant and well-informed. Until we meet again, aloha away.